Um, thank you everyone for coming. I'm Ivan Rodas, and I'm here to talk about benchmarking, which is a hot topic always, and you know, everybody is excited when new benchmarks come out, and everybody's trying to either repeat them or prove them wrong on something. Uh, this presentation will be mostly about uh, how to do certain aspects of benchmarking. More advanced users will probably know them already. So uh, this is you know, how, how to do and what not to do when doing a benchmark or operating system. And the thing is, I've also tried to do some new benchmarks of FreeBSD, which will be kind of you know, extensive and useful for the years to come. The last one, last ones were done by Chris Kenaway in 2008. This is the time frame of the 7.x release. It's a bit old. And also, there are some benchmarks appearing on the mailing lists and on various blogs, which uh, measure certain aspects of FreeBSD performance and which, is, which are not really uh, professionally done and which um, paint not so pretty picture for FreeBSD. And I try to either repeat them or you know, prove them to be done in a less than satisfactory way. So when I say most of the developers, I mean developers who are interested in measuring performance of certain aspects of their systems or subsystems they are working on. Uh, system administrations, system administrators will also find some mat useful material here. And lastly, I'm going to talk for a few slides or a few sentences about how and when to avoid benchmarking because sometimes you know uh, you don't really need it. Um, generally, when you're doing a benchmark, that means you have some purpose in mind. Either you want to compare your system to some other, some else, some other system, you want to compare your hardware to some other hardware, you want to compare your application to some other application. It is mostly useless to perform a benchmark benchmark on its own. On its own. So. If you have a number that says you know that many megabytes per second or that many operations per second, and you don't have anything to compare it to, it's just mostly useless. I mean, you can compare it to a previous version of a system that's also valid. You know, it doesn't have to be a completely new system or completely new hardware. But generally, benchmarking meaning benchmarking means you have to compare it to something. Um, and the goal of a good benchmark is to make it repeatable to make it uh, uh, useful to other, for other people, to make the description of the benchmark as elaborate or as complete as possible so the other people can repeat it and see for themselves if what you did is uh, good or are their own uh, measurements comparable to yours. So uh, I'm also going to talk extensively on how the benchmarks I, mean, I did were set up and what I did to actually uh, arrive at the results. Repeatability is always a good thing. Uh, even if you're doing benchmark for only for yourself, it means that next week or net, next month or next year, uh, you will be able to create the same environment and repeat your benchmark to check if something has changed, for example. Is the new version of an application of, or an operating system different or maybe more or less performant? I hope to get some uh, high-end hardware for this, but unfortunately I didn't. So this is uh, all done on two identically configured servers, IBM uh, One U servers, and only a four-core CPU without hyper-threading. So four cores is everything you get in this presentation. Um, there's two gigabytes of RAM and uh, four SATA drives set in RAID zero because I wanted to stress performance and not really redundancy and reliability. And nev networking was done on a gigabit embedded NIC, which has two ports, one of which is connected to the internet and one of which is used to connect uh, the back sides of the servers with a really simple wire, so without a switch in, the mean, in, the, in between. Some notes about software versions. I did both FreeBSD 9.1, which is the release version, and the FreeBSD 10 current, which is the development, the future version 10. 
Uh, this version 10 was for approximately two weeks ago, so it is really recent. Of course, uh, the debugging was turned, all, turned off, witness invariants and such things. Uh, for comparison with Linux, I used CentOS 6.3 because it is really uh, probably the most used uh, so-called enterprise version of Linux. I had PostgreSQL 9.2, Blockbench, Boni, Plus Plus, Filebench, and uh, my own uh, bullet cache server. I will describe it later. And as preliminaries also, I'd like to talk about what and how uh, to interpret, uh, to, po to post-process your benchmark results. And this is a picture which is in every uh, college textbook about doing any kind of measurement. So I will also repeat it here. Uh, when we talk about measurement results, we can talk about how accurate they are or how precise they are. If they are accurate, they measure the real, uh, the real uh, <coughs> thing, they measure the real aspect of the system you're trying to measure. And if they are precise, they are all clustered around basically the same value, which should be the tr one true value you are trying to measure, but it is usually isn't. So it will be more clear in examples. But it's also related to, to, to introducing measurement errors. We have systematic errors, those which are uh, uh, influencing our measurement in a way that we measure actually something else. There will be some interesting examples here. So basically, you're thinking you're measuring one aspect of the system, and in actuality, you are measuring something different. And also random errors, which are basically noise, measurement noise, which can be uh, which can come from all parts of uh, the system. You, you can basically uh, either reduce it or just live with it and you know, use statistics to establish some kind of medium or average value. Uh, lots of benchmarks also exaggerate in their precision. So you can see some benchmarks on the internet that says you know, hard, a hard drive has uh, 412, or SSD in this case, 412 point five sixty seven megabytes per second. This is usually nonsense because you cannot actually measure uh, hard drive or SSD performance to that, this precision. Uh, in most cases, I mean really most cases, the best you can do is measure, you know, for uh, the, the maybe the first two, you know, significant digits. So this would be probably be better expressed like 410 megabytes per second. Um, in theory, you could achieve you know, really, really, really good precisions, like in this case. But in practice, you won't, ever. It's also useful to, to introduce the error bars in the form of uh, you know, uh, either on graphs, doing this small uh, extensions on the graph below and above the real value, or express it numerically or something. Uh, basically, uh, the, the error bars are, are an expression of the precision of your measurements. Confidence in the, that the measurements are really actually precise or really uh, repeatable in a way that is useful. Uh, my favorite example here is measuring hard drive perform performance because you get a lot of file system benchmarks on the internet. We just you know, uh, create a RAID array or you just to use a single drive and uh, create a file system on it and just run some kind of benchmark on it. Uh, this is not exactly the way it should be done because especially on mechanical hard drives, so-called spinning graphs and such, you have huge uh, differences in performance, in linear uh, sequential uh, read performance or sequential write performance between the inner part of the drive and the outer part of the drive. Uh, if you use the disk info utility, which is in part of every FreeBSD, it's a part of the base system, you can get a really nice uh, illustration of how performance differs when you go from the outside of the drive platters to the inside of the drive platters. So for example, if you, use, if you just create a file system on such a drive and measure file system performance in any kind of utility, I mean really any kind of any kind of benchmark utility, uh, it really, uh, it's very much influenced uh, with, uh, 
on which part of the drive your file system code places the data. So it, if it places the data uh, on the outside, you'd get one kind of performance curve. And if it places in, in the inside, you'll get another, another uh, type of performance curve. Uh, this, this, this is a difference of approximately, I think, 100 megabytes per second. So really, it is significant. So don't do file system benchmarking on whole drives, especially not on mechanical drives. SSDs have a different kind of problem. Uh, they have a lot of internal structure. The flash translation layer basically says that uh, your data, which you're thinking you're writing on a particular place on a drive, can actually end up in some other place on the drive. And it can be internally fragmented, and it can be compressed, and it can be uh, you know, transferred in a ways you have no influence over. So benchmarking flash is a whole other topic. Um, this is also an illustration of a few runs of uh, file system uh, of disk info benchmark, which is shown in the previous slide. And it says it, it basically shows how uh, there's quite a lot of noise when benchmarking hard drives, even those, though this is disk info, so it doesn't pass through a file system. It talks directly to the hard drive via uh, slash dev slash uh, DA0 or some other. Uh, device drive specific uh, path. Uh, basically, it says that there's still significant noise here. This is noise between, for example, 300 megabytes per second and 350 megabytes per second. It's significant. It's, the noise is also present uh, in all cases if, it's, if, the be if the measurement is on the outside of the platters or on the inside of the platters. It is still present. It is not really something you can avoid. So you use statistics to get an average value. Uh, how many people have seen this video? Yeah. Basically, the guy shouts at a drive, drive array. There's a drive array. It's in a data center. The, the guy shouts at it, and his acoustic vibrations are transferred to the drive heads, and he sees noticeable spikes in latency. So really, mechanical drives can be really, really sensitive. You get visible, visible spikes. Uh, this means that you know if you really want to get scientific about it, you will really need to go to, to really much trouble to do it right. Fortunately, uh, you can always aim for you know, ballpark value. For example, you always want to get values like you know 300 megabytes per second, not exactly 335.456. You know, you, you really have to be realistic about your precisions you can, you can expect on it. So, uh, what do you want to do with your benchmark, a hard drive or a file system? Basically, you want to create a partition, which is somewhere close to the outside of the drive, and which is small enough so that the difference in performance is not noticeable between its beginning and its end. Uh, this partition has to be of large enough size so you can run meaningful benchmarks on it. For example, it has to be at least <coughs> two times larger than your available memory. Because if you run a sequential read or sequential write test, you need to ensure that it's not cached. Uh, but since a lot of data comes to file system metadata, and you have the reserved portion of file systems, which is in UFS approximately 8%, uh, usually you have to do three times or four times the size of your RAM for this kind of partition. And as an illustration, uh, this on the left side, this is my partition. And on the right side, this is again the graph showing the whole uh, drive performance. So when you look at just this partition, the inner, middle, and um, uh, the outer, uh, middle, and inner parts of this partition basically have the same performance, plus minus some noise. And of course, the whole drive is a completely different story. So um, these are the results. Um, I think 
the blue channel is not working on this projector. This should be a blue bar. Uh, blue bars, or in this case, black bars, uh, are Linux performance. And the red one is FreeBSD 9, and the yellow one is FreeBSD 10. This is a result from Boni++. Uh, I'm only using the file system bandwidth, actually, the sequential read and write rates, and also uh, the rewrite rate. Um, you can see that the results are interesting, and it's hard to, hard to tell if you, know, you can set much emphasis to the Linux performance, which is worse on writing and better on reading, or the other way around. What is interesting, and which will be confirmed in other benchmarks, is that actually there's, there's happened some development between 9.5.1 release of FreeBSD and 10.0 release of FreeBSD in such a way that uh, basically rewrite performance is much better. Uh, also, the read performance is a little bit better. It means that some kind, some kind of new development has probably happened in the area of a concurrency on maybe uh, um, more fine-grain locking in some part of the system. When you think of file systems, basically file systems are kind of a database. You get records, which are files stored on you know, a medium. Uh, these records are simple, but they have associated metadata. They have associated uh, security permissions. They have attributes. Uh, they also need to be concurrently ac accessed, whether for reading or for writing. So this database really uh, can get quite complex. ZFS is, is notorious for having a really, really complex layout. It basically uh, is com more compared uh, or uh, more often compared to a database than of traditional file systems. And the file system needs to support you know, other feature features like they need to be reliable. They need to, need to support trim operations. Uh, network file systems are also, also complex in a completely different way. Next, I'd like to talk about the block bench benchmark. Uh, it basically is a very small utility, but very cleverly written. Its goal is to create a tree of smallish files. It, it has two types of files. One is uh, one is a sort of uh, text files of two kilobytes in size or four kilobytes in size, and the other is like uh, multimedia files, or in this case, image files, which are 64K in size. But generally, the sizes are not always the same. They are spread across this spectrum between two kilobytes and 64 kilobytes. Uh, the interesting thing is that Blockbench is multi-threaded. It, it creates hundreds hundreds of threads. It can create hundreds of threads. The default configuration starts 110 threads. And all of these threads are divided into several groups. One, groups is, one group uh, creates new files. The other group uh, modifies files. The third gr uh, group reads files. Um, in this case, the third group, the one that reads files, is the largest one. So we have, for example, 80, thread, 80 threads reading files, and the rest are reading, uh, writing or creating them. <coughs> It also uses atomic renames for some writes. So for example, it modifies a blog file, and then it renames it to, to overwrite the old content. This is important, because in FreeBSD, uh, much emphasis is given to write locking. If you've seen any Linux benchmarks, uh, you've seen picture, pictures like this. So basically, Linux performance in blog bench is all the way over there almost 2 million. And FreeBSD performance is way over here, 700,000. So it's puzzling. So why would this be? This all is done on UFS. I have no ZFS numbers here. Um, basically, it comes down to how the op operating system schedules reading and writing. What is interesting is that there is some improvement between 9 and 10 versions. And to prove it, you can use the very easy, very convenient <coughs> utility present in FreeBSD, which is Ministat. It is also part of the base system. So we already have two benchmarks. One is disk info, and one is uh, or, or two utilities. One is disk info, one is Ministat, 
they can be used to create quality benchmarks. Uh, I, I basically was wonder, wondering what's the difference between difference between 9.1 and 10 releases. And it says that approximately 90% uh, uh, better performance is achieved in 10, uh, but in, in the read case, but approximately 17% lower performance is achieved for the write case. So it needs, it needs more investigation. Uh, block bench is a multi tether benchmark. It, it uses a lot of parallel operations on the same tree of files. Uh, there's something called the write bias of FreeBSD, which basically means that writes on a single file block all other access. I think it even blocks other reads. I'm not sure. I think it is such. Um, it is uh, useful to remember the directories. The directories themselves are also files. So write operations on the directories themselves are also blocked. I did some system call tracing. Basically, you get a, lo a long list of uh, syscalls. And it clearly shows that there are multitude, multitude of threads uh, during various operations, opening, reading, writing, closing, and such. And from all this data, we can create a pretty picture, which kind of characterizes the number and the frequency of operations. Uh, what isn't shown on this axis is uh, these zeros should be operation duration times. So uh, they are really very small in the order of uh, microseconds. So uh, it, get, it got all rounded up to zero, um, rounded down to zero. Uh, we see from this graph that Blobench does a lot of <coughs> what we know, knew before. Read operations are dominant. Uh, surprisingly, there are a lot of close operations, which is kind of normal when you say, when you know that uh, a block bench opens files, modifies them, or reads them, and then closes them again. And there was a really small number of write operations, basically this curve over here. Uh, it is interesting to note that read operations also take the longest comparatively to everything else, which I think indicates that uh, they are actually blocked by other types of operations, but this needs more closer investigation. Um, the other benchmark which is often used in the FreeBSD world is PostgreSQL benchmark. It's a database, and in this case, I've used the PG bench benchmark, which is a part of PostgreSQL source base. I've initialized the benchmark database with the scale factor of 1,000, which means 100 million records. The database is approximately 16 gigabytes in size. It's fixed in RAM. This is deliberate because I'd like to test, uh, for example, concurrency in database access without, uh, without really benchmarking the hard drive at the same time. And the configuration is, of course, uh, stable during the whole tests. Um, these two machines I was talking about at the beginning are configured so that they dual boot Linux and FreeBSD. Uh, both Linux and FreeBSD have, this, have access to the same partition. So the same partition, the same file system is used for both Linux benchmarks and FreeBSD benchmarks. This is the partition I was talking about at the beginning. So that, that, that one with, uh, uh, which is, which is, uh, which has small deviations between access, access uh, performance on outside, middle, and inner tracks. PostgreSQL is a fairly modern database, which, mean it, which means it has lots going on in the back end. The most important thing is the write logging. Basically, if you do a write operation in PostgreSQL, uh, it, the data doesn't go directly to the database store itself. It goes, it's, it's written in the write ahead log first. And periodically, this data is then transferred from this write ahead log 
to the database storage itself. The problem is that this can happen uh, at unexpected times. So for example, if you run a short benchmark, you can run the whole benchmark with the data residing in the write ahead logs and not in the data storage itself. And you can run another benchmark, which is uh, started, and then right in the middle of benchmarks, this transfer occurs between the write ahead logs and the proper storage. And this introduces a large amount of noise in your benchmark results. So benchmark runs need to be longish, at least five minutes, 10 minutes. There are, there are recommendations for even longer times, like half an hour. And it is crucial that the PostgreSQL server itself, the daemon itself, be restarted be between the benchmarks. Because a restart of PostgreSQL causes all data to be transferred from the logs, from the writing head logs, to the data storage itself. So you get uh, uh, more consistent, more uh, uh, precise measurements. And also, it's necessary to turn on out of vacuum. Uh, the vacuum in PostgreSQL is the part of the system which basically uh, cleans up data uh, in case of updated records and deleted records and, create, and calculates some statistics information, which can also influence your results so they can be scattered or very noisy. Um, on this particular machine, uh, which is the quad-core Xeon I was talking about, uh, I've run benchmarks which are read-only, which are read-write, and also uh, I've run benchmarks which are on the file system, meaning on the drives, on the drives themselves, on the disk array, and on the memory file system, which is a RAMFS in case of Linux and TMPFS in case of FreeBSD. I've also done some remote benchmarking, meaning remote connection to the database from the other server. I will talk about some of the results in more detail. Um, so on Linux, I've discovered that there's almost no, almost no difference between fully cached uh, database on X4 in read-only benchmarks and its RAM file system or memory file system. On FreeBSD, using TMPFS is faster than, than using UFS, which is fully uh, loaded or are few fully um, pre-warmed database content. Um, the blue lines are basically Linux and the red lines are FreeBSD. This dip here is very surprising. It is also very repeatable. Um, I get it in all configurations, in all uh, benchmark runs. I have a theory why is, is, why is it happening. I'll try to explain it later. Uh, what most people are interested in right now is that on this particular machine, I get lower performance of FreeBSD than uh, of Linux, except for this dip here. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but there are two lines here, the dark blue one and the light blue one. Uh, the dark blue one is a uh, disk file system. And the light blue one is a memory file system. On FreeBSD, the dark red one is uh, the disk file system, UUFS. And the uh, light red one is uh, TMPFS, the memory file system. There is a noticeable difference here. This is, these are the right results, where again the Linux curve is the blue one, and the FreeBSD curve is the red one. Uh, even though this particular benchmark should really depend on the disk performance, um, apparently it doesn't. The operating system has a huge influence on the total performance. Uh, this graph shows benchmarks of uh, remote access performance. So what I did was use the same servers. One was obviously running the database, and the other was running the benchmark client. Uh, the database was always on a memory file system. And this is the distinction between 
uh, local axis, which is the, the full lines here, the dark blue one and the dark red one, and the, the remote axis over here, which is the light blue one and the yellow one. We can see that remote axis helps a little bit because uh, the benchmark client itself, itself is a CPU intensive process. So when separating the benchmark client and the other machine, you freeze some resources on the server itself. But this is offset almost entirely by the fact that there is a TCP connection between those machines, even though it's just a wire between the two network cards. Uh, the same general conclusion can be drawn that FreeBSD still has some work to do in performance improvement. And because we can now separate the client on the on another machine, it just I think that this dip is actually caused by some kind of scheduler issue in FreeBSD. In the original case, you have both the, the client uh, and the server processes on the same machine, and somehow if uh, at approximately uh, 12 concurrent clients, Linux has some kind of a problem, I think. So my best guess is that it's a scheduler issue in Linux. However, uh, to get some more optimistic news, these are the results done by Florian Smith and I'd also think Jeff Robertson on a hugely uh, different machine. The, this machine has uh, 40 cores, it has four CPUs, 10 cores each, and 80 threads in total on the system. And the results are much better on such large configuration. Uh, basically, in this configuration, uh, Lin uh, FreeBSD is consistently better than Linux, so there's some hope yet. Uh, the algorithms used in achieving um, large scalabilities probably favor uh, systems with a large number of CPUs, so something needs to be done to maybe close that gap. Uh, Linux, which is blue in this graph, uh, lacks in performance up until approximately 32, 32 clients or 32 connections to the database server. This is also PostgreSQL 9.2. Uh, this is also a benchmark of uh, local benchmark client and the local server on the same machine. Um, next benchmark. I would like to talk about is FileBench. This is a benchmark done, I think, by Sun Microsystems back in the day, and it has a large number of profiles. Uh, one profile, for example, is a file server, which basically creates a list of uh, large, large file files, and the other is the web proxy profile, which creates smaller files. Uh, there are different benchmarks operations being done on these files on these profiles. Unfortunately, I think that this <coughs> benchmark has some problems running on FreeBSD. I have some strange results, I will talk about them later, and I'm not so sure that it's really a correct benchmark. I'm not sure that these results I will show you are really uh, correct on the FreeBSD side. I've done local drive measurements on UFS on this partition I was talking about and also NFS3 and NFS4, because there was some talk on the mailing list about the huge performance difference between NFS3 and 4 in FreeBSD. So I wanted to find out what's happening. Um, this is the file server profile. And uh, the results are strange. On the one side, we have Linux, which is this huge dark bar here. Uh, the, the results is larger than 800 megabytes per second, which is obviously due to caching, uh, which is all right, or actually it would be all right if it not for FreeBSD result, which is this red bar here, which is almost 100 megabytes per second. Um, the drives themselves can pull 450 megabytes per second at least. So I think that the, the huge difference between 
the, the Linux results and result and FreeBSD result are due to benchmark uh, problems. So this is an example of, of maybe a systemic er systemic error or systemic problem in benchmarks. Um, I've run NFS three and NFS four. Uh, these are the two uh, bars right here: the light blue one and the dark blue one. The light blue one is NFS three, and the dark dark blue one is NFS four. And even on Linux, NFS four is significantly slower for some reason. I was talking, I was hoping to talk to Rick, uh, but I think he's not on the conference right now. The FreeBSD results are lower than Linux, than Linux results. I really cannot explain why uh, local disk performance should be so low, because this is much lower than hardware itself can do on this machine. And the NFS result is, again, significantly lower than the NFS3 result. Uh, the NFS were, was mounted over TCP. On the other hand, we have the web proxy profile, which again shows really quirky results, um, but a bit different. This time, Linux has lower performance on the local hard drive measurements, and FreeBSD has hugely better performance on the same conditions. Again, uh, it looks to me like the benchmark itself is wrong. The benchmark utility itself seems to be uh, Either uh, either it has a bug or it is uh, Linux specific and there's some problems with porting it to FreeBSD or something. This is possible, but not really probable that such a result would happen. So this, is just go this just goes to say that you need to choose your benchmarks carefully. Uh, as an interesting side result, this is also bench. This is the same uh, file bench benchmark on the file server profile, and I've used the FreeBSD as an NFS three server and Linux as the NFS three client, and shows that the results are basically the same, um, which is encouraging. Uh, last year I talked about my bullet cache server. It's a memory cache server similar to memcached. Its specific thing is that it creates a TCP traffic, traffic of very small tra transactions, like 32 bytes to 128 byte messages being going back and forth between the client and the server. Um, it is heavily multithreaded and also uses non-blocking I.O. And if you benchmark over Unix sockets, meaning the both both the server and the client are on the same machine, and talk about talk to uh, Unix domain sockets, you get uh, easily two million transactions per second on mid-range hardware. Um, the results are in favor on FreeBSD on this particular benchmark, but the benchmark itself was developed on FreeBSD by me, so I uh, used a lot of tuning for this to actually happen. I also would not advertise this as a truly good benchmark between Linux and FreeBSD. It's more of a curiosity. Um, between measurement errors, the same performance is between 9.1 and 10 releases. Uh, it is, the, the benchmark is interesting because, because it illustrates that uh, FreeBSD's TCP stack is fairly multi-threaded and fair, fairly uh, finely locked. So uh, t TCP transactions, TCP streams do not uh, influence each other. Uh, multiple concurrent, concurrent streams can be used on FreeBSD without performance problems. It also shows that I got, for example, uh, nearly 500,000 packets per, per second per direct direction in this configuration. So this is a, a lot of really small TCP messages. So I'm uh, glad with, I'm satisfied with the performance shown. Uh, to illustrate the difference between TCP over 
the over the uh, plain wire connecting plain Ethernet wire connecting the servers and Unix domain sockets. Uh, Unix domain sockets performance uh, crosses one million transactions per second. But this is also very natural, really expected between, on the other on one hand, you have the whole inter Ethernet channel. You, you have the whole Ethernet uh, uh, actual networking happening. And the other, on the other hand, you have only uh, memory passing between processes. So one thing that a lot of people are trying to figure out is what to tune on FreeBSD to get acceptable performance. And I would argue that, uh, especially with uh, release 10, and even the now current release 9.1, there is not much you can do, or actually the system auto-configures itself pretty well. We had an increase in uh, read-ahead tunable recently, also uh, buff space, high, high buff space and low buff space, so they are now auto-tuned. You don't have to touch them. Uh, some tutorials ad advertise increasing the network uh, uh, transmit and receive descriptor, descriptor rings, on, or increasing their size. I haven't actually noticed some significant difference on my previous benchmark. So uh, there is some difference. I'm not so sure if this is because of uh, maybe measurement noise. I need to do some more benchmarking to actually find out. But the point is the default values are actually pretty good. I also try to increase the number of interrupts per second allowed on the EM driver, on the CPUs. And if I increase them, I get also a very, very small improvement maybe less than 1% of the performance. So unless you are really trying to squeeze out uh, sub percent performance from your machines, you, you don't have to touch the, for example, network driver configuration. Uh, Current.max users uh, governs basically uh, the size and number of internal network, internal kernel structures. It's been auto-tuned for, year, for years now. And for example, uh, for the last example, this tunable, which is maybe familiar to everyone who, is, who, who had run Apache or PostgreSQL or something else, which has a lot of uh, processes forking, is also gone from uh, 9.x releases. So my point is, um, don't, you don't have to rely on manual tuning as much as you used to on FreeBSD. Uh, I didn't give any CPU specific benchmarks and by that I mean I didn't do any encryption I didn't do any kind of compression benchmarks and such because for the most part they are trivial unless you have a broken compiler or unless you have a, uh, a different tuning in your compression libraries or different algorithms in your libc uh, you're not going to find any significant or any useful difference in such benchmarks. So uh, most of the benchmarks which are now available on the internet show uh, a noticeable difference in compression performance. For example, they use gzip or some other libz uh, utility to compress a huge file on Linux and they do it again on FreeBSD and then show, for example, that Linux performance is a little bit better, or the PSD performance is a little, little bit better. Uh, this, for example, relies on how the libz was compiled itself. Uh, for one time, uh, FreeBSD didn't use an assembler optimized part of the compression algorithm because there was a security bug in it. So a libz was compiled with C only uh, code which had a lower performance than the assembler optimized version. So this is the cause of a drop in such benchmarks. Um, if you want to, you can test the quality of libc and libeb implementation, for example. You can test the quality of SCDIO, uh, SCDIO uh, uh, set of calls or something like this. But then be sure you know what are you benchmarking. 
you're not benchmarking, for example, the kernel in this case. You're benchmarking the algorithms in your libc. You can also test your compiler. Uh, PBSD has a sort of oldish compiler by default. This will change in 9.0. And just, and as, just as an illustration, uh, you, can find, you can find benchmarks like this floating around the internet then where you have uh, for one side GCC and recent versions of GCC as well. And on the other hand, you have L LVM, c -Lang compiler, and so, and for example, this particular benchmark shows huge difference between uh, c -Lang and GCC. Uh, what this picture doesn't show is that there are other benchmarks showing completely different values. So in this case, uh, it is mostly, uh, you, you can run benchmarks like this. There's no problem in running benchmarks like this. But you have to know that you are running a benchmark of a compiler. So if you compile, uh, for example, uh, a compression library or an encryption library with different compilers on different operating system, you, you, it's all right. You can do this. But just uh, realize that you are not exactly benchmarking, for example, the, peop the operating system kernel you are benchmarking uh, the quality of a compiler. And um, sometimes <coughs> benchmarking is done in circumstances which really don't require it. I mean, there are a lot of reasons where you can, why you can do benchmarks. Uh, but there are also reasons when benchmarking really it's not as useful, or the numbers are not as useful as uh, you think. Uh, you can choose an operating system based on its features, based on its community, based on its uh, large uh, number of software or supported software. Uh, you can also say that it's cheaper to buy another machine and run a slightly slower operating system than to reconfigure everything. And uh, one conclusion that is also good to keep in mind is that actually FreeBSD gets better through the years and it, cons it consistently gets more and more scalable. During the Chris Kennaway benchmarks of uh, 7.x era, uh, FreeBSD has strived to achieve scalability on eight CPU hardware. And it succeeded, but that's old news now. And during the 10.x era, uh, realistically, uh, FreeBSD probably aimed for uh, being scalable or being better than Linux on hardware containing 32 CPUs. So uh, it's consistently, consistently improving. It is very much a modern system going forward. Um, you need to benchmark maybe out of curiosity. You need to benchmark if you really want to know what's going on in the system when you're planning or budgeting for a new project, when your boss tells you to. And finally, we, got, we get advocacy. And this is perhaps the most commonly used reason to do, or actually to publish benchmarks on the internet. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, during the de developer summit, I was talking to some of the other developers and some of the cluster administrators of FreeBSD, and we will try to get up some continual benchmarking going on. So maybe. Uh, at the next BSD can or something like that, uh, I will have some updated numbers and I will have some uh, nice uh, performance cur curve improvements over the time, over the year of FreeBSD development. I think this is it. Um, the point of this presentation was mainly to point out some interesting facts about benchmarking itself, uh, about uh, what to do and what not to do when benchmarking a non predict system. So I hope it, be, it was a reasonably interesting presentation to hear, and thank you for staying.